Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. The following is an interview with the founder of Midwest Bigfoot Researchers. Randy began his foray into this world after a series of fantastic experiences that occurred when he was only 10 years old, in 1977. He has actively pursued these creatures since the late 1990s. One note on the technical end, the microphone I had on Randy made the squeaking of his chair sound like the bugles of undead elk, so I only used the audio from my microphone, and therefore I'm unable to isolate his audio, so you hear all of my little contributions. Sorry about that. And I do have a full video on the narrative itself, which I encourage you to view before diving into this interview. My discussions with Randy occurred in March of 2019. All of the illustrations you'll see in this video were drawn by Randy himself in an attempt to solidify his childhood experiences. This is the most unbelievable story I've ever considered believing. Ideas of what I, what I wanted to do with them when I first started out, but now I just wanted to get it done just to, for myself. Right. Um, you get a, the, the most important thing to me, though, is like seriously about, like, it, 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 I would love to have you know, justice, as far as the government goes, but the Sasquatch is the most important thing because, like, I'll, I mean, it, it didn't start off that to begin with. I wanted to prove, I wanted to prove my story. Right. So, you know, I wanted to prove for it. That's how it started off. It wasn't like I'm, a, I'm around them like it was when I was a kid, but they're, I know they're close proximity. Within, you know, a few steps, they could be right, you know, in front right. of me. But they, they choose to hide and sit there real quietly, you mm -hmm. know, there. That's why I brought Dango here. It was like, I can show you all the audio that we had, but we could, we could never get footage of them. We would always do the belly crawl and go behind all these bushes. And I swear, there was one time, there were five feet in front of us, down here behind this great big huge dead tree down here and sit down there at night. And we could hear them sit up there. I didn't have a campfire either because that's another thing I don't like to do because they use that to their advantage, and I think it, that we can't, like, I, it impairs my view of things in the, in the woods. Right. Do you think they like fire? Or do, oh, do I they? don't think they mind it, but, um, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, it's not like they're going to go up and play with it or nothing. I don't mean nothing like that. I just, I don't think it keeps them away. I just, I think it gives them an advantage, you know, the way it lights up and you can't right. see past that area. And then you're blind because you're looking at it. Plus it stinks. I think it's, plus it's, like, kind of rude and evasive that I'm not, I just usually bring like the big bug candles. Yeah. <laughs> and have some of those around me. That's what I. That's what I usually do, and just sit out there, and that's good enough light for me. What? Well, that because that was just right out there, right? That yeah, you right up on the ridge. Yeah. That you uh, put on bug spray, and then they were grunting at you. No, no, they're snorting. Snorting. <laughs> like it, just like a deer does, but it was coming from eight feet, like next to me, like twenty feet, not even twenty feet away, but it was eight feet up. You know, right? And I could hear it walking right alongside me, and I'm like, "Oops, sorry." Only so many things <laughs> that can be. Um, those really giant deer out there. Those and the, the <laughs> what was the other? The two-legged bear that the other yeah, people. Oh yeah, that two-legged brown bear that's up by uh, Horseman's Campground. By Horseman's Campground. Yeah. Okay, so I am still not entirely clear on the story in its entirety. I know you emailed it to me. I know that we've talked about it before, but if you could just go over it like I'm a fourth grader. What, the, the early Starting when my you were, childhood one? Yeah, because I know it started in the woods, and then with All that right. other... I'll start, let me let me get something to drink. Sure thing. Are you still going? Oh, great. Thank God for editing. <laughs> yeah, no. Trust me. I don't care. Uh, about the cameras. They're basically going to record like well, the, four hours. Before we knew it, ever knew it was an encounter was the, the, um, the August 77 one was uh, the other mic the human that I met in some church thing on a Wednesday. Uh, August was getting getting close to school and a lot of us kids wanted to go do something. So we got bored, he came over and we got bored around the house and we rode our bikes up to the woods. Um, I probably talked him into it because I like to go in the woods and we rode our bikes up there. And uh, I just started looking around at things. We got into the these heavy bushes that looked like it had an opening in it. A lot of the, well, yeah, I, can't, I can't show you now, I do have it on video, but like, there's quite a bit of room underneath these bushes and the bushes were close together and they had vines going over the top of it. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff on top of the bushes and plus the bushes were real thick and. And this is right where we saw the steps put on the tree, right? 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was on the other side of the woods over there on the, the, the pavement side of Morris Lake. Okay. Um, we got, we were crawling through there and it, it was kind of cool because it was like a maze. It went from like little bush to little bush and some of them were pretty tall under there where you could almost stand up. Mm -hmm. And we came in this room and it had blankets and not nice blankets, like raggedy blankets and, and, uh, I can't, I can't remember exactly what was on there, but there was a lot of weird shiny stuff hanging on like the wall because it was like literally a wall of like vines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And pictures, like wallet pictures of like what you get with wallets and, and picture frames that people threw away with those pictures in it, like stuck to these little branches and stuff on the wall and we figured a little, a bum was back there. Right. Um, we didn't think much of it, we left and we kept on exploring when we came across that pond that I showed you with the tree and they were just putting up those those steps and they'd not done that last one okay and there's two boys back there and an older boy that was older than us his first name was Russell and uh, another Mike and that was our age back there fishing and um, camping from the last time before going to school we made friends with them we decided we we're gonna go back to my house and get our gear and come back okay and go camping with them and we we rode up there and it got to my house which is about three miles away from this woods um and it was you know probably mid evening and then it took a while for mike's mom to get there and for us to get back to the woods it was getting dark which i don't i don't remember what time that would be in september but or i mean uh, august would be like 10 o'clock or something like it. It was, so it's fairly late it was fairly late when we got there i guess we couldn't find them I know now that the trail we must have went on it has a big loop in it and we thought we were lost we weren't really lost we ended up at the same spot we <laughs> it was like uh, anyway we couldn't find him when it was getting dark we set up camp there and um stayed the night until like sometime in the middle of the night we heard the older boy calling for Mike screaming and we thought they were trying to scare us until we heard like sounds that we knew that couldn't have been you know this kid making the sounds by himself right and we weren't sure it were growls weird screams and you know bigfoot sounds that we didn't know we were hearing uh -huh. but we were scared we left everything there we got on our bikes and left in the middle of the night but i think we got back before 11 30 because i remember my parents were still watching tv mm -hmm. and they laughed at us oh you guys chickened out we'll have to go back and get the stuff in the morning he says, well, you guys are gonna have to ride back and get it yourself. We we got we went back there the next morning and the pictures saw what I saw. There was a news crew, um, police and a search crew up there at the at the corner of uh, 108th and Morris Lake and border of Berry County and Kent County at the Middle Bowl State Game Area looking for Mike. But what we saw was Russell, the oldest boy, talking to um, Channel 13 news crew about some hairy bum taking his friend and they blamed a, um, a local um, temporary bus driver and put him in jail they said he was wandering in the woods and lived, lived nearby so that's what everybody thought happened um, until about a week later um, and, and we, 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 thought we, had to, we had to talk to the cops too to get our stuff back because they won't let us in there obviously to go get our tent right. searching so um the guy that brought our our tent back and stuff was actually the guy that i was going to find out later went by the name of john redcorn which was the man in black. man in black guy which was a native american uh i don't want i don't want to tell you too many details i know exactly who he is and what he did uh before he had that job even um I, I suppose I can go back to that too, but um, he brought our tents back and took a report down. We didn't think of anything of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, like I said, a week went by and uh, some strange things were happening at the neighbor's house. And um, as you can see on like my report, our neighbor's house is probably almost a mile apart, and there's a cornfield separate. And, and I lived on an old farm, abandoned farm with a bunch of old farm built the farm buildings and barns on it that year um like i said it was a cornfield that went in between us there was a, there's also a, um a creek that went by behind my house and twisted all the way down to his um 
days before um, my encounter happened, the neighbor boy Tim stopped hanging around with the, the rest of us. There was there was uh, um, other neighbor boys and his siblings and stuff. We, we all played together and. Um, Three days prior to that, he kept on telling us that he had uh, found a pet orangutan that had escaped and he had befriended and we all thought he was crazy. And we did, we did, we just like, oh, he's made an imaginary friend, isn't that cute, you know? And we, we made fun of him for a while. <laughs> um, there was other uh, strange things that you know, one time we were thought we were chasing a dog one day, but I, and now it turns out I don't think that was a dog. But uh, that was actually the day before the encounter we didn't know what we were seeing. That was the, uh, that was going to be turning out to be Mike the Juvenile Sasquatch. That what you thought was a dog darting by? He, well, yeah, he was watching us on the bushes before that encounter, I remembered, like, but we, uh, um, a, a day or two before that, had chased the big Siberian Husky neighbor's dog around to catch it and give it back to the neighbors, and we thought somebody had also lost a dog because well, we saw something in the bushes and we saw something running away brown on four legs. We thought it was somebody's dog and it <laughs> he actually went across the street, went back across the street, not back in the creek and he probably climbed a tree because we were, you know, thinking it was a dog and we could not find him. There was like at least three of us uh -huh. running after him, looking every which way and he was just gone. He got away from us. <laughs> we didn't think anything around. Right Where'd that dog go? That's all we knew. But like um the next day, uh was Saturday. Um, Tim had stayed home and the rest of his family had left to go get school supplies and go eat out and the sitter was there to watch the baby and the, the um, Tim stayed by because he wanted or stayed back because he wanted to play with his orangutan friend. Um, I, I wasn't sure until I got down there later that day that, that he was actually home. I had knocked on the door and that's what the babysitter told me that he was over in the cornfield that was next to the house. There's a little row of trees that separated the the, um, the cornfield too, but it was what it was like about 40, 50 feet away from the house, the cornfield. And he was sitting out there, and I get out there, and uh, the babysitter said he was playing with a troll. The babysitter thought it was a troll. Yeah, the babysitter said it was a troll-like looking thing. And um, in the cornfield. In the cornfield. That's 50 feet away from the house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she said she could see him peek out every once in a while, like that picture. And, and that was that was the first image I had of him too. Was like that. Do you remember Boba's nose uh -huh. and, and stuff of him, you know, peeking through the cornfield? I walked out there, and Tim's sitting in his underwear, his clothes folded, but I neatly sit beside him. He's sitting on that ball, and he has like all his brothers and sisters' toys out there, like Barbie dolls, um, balls, like all the Tonka trucks. I knew exactly what trucks he had because, like, he had the, all the opposite ones that I had. <laughs> I had like the steamroller and he had the truck and I, you know. Coordinated. Yeah, you know, but um, he was out there trying to see whatever, you know, he can entice him to get out of that cornfield with him. He said he would whistle every once in a while and he would come, that, that was another weird thing that he would whistle for him. And he told me that he, he, he was going to, like, I gave him a name and he can, he can say his name. And sure, whatever. And like, he was just here, Tim said. Oh, okay. So I waited for a couple minutes and that's what we saw. And, you know, I waited and sure enough a, a face popped out but he didn't come right out he was just kind of looking real shy like that uh -huh. and um tim says it's somebody's pet orangutan he's really friendly you don't got to be afraid of him he's only about like four or five feet tall and uh that you know he, he's been reading up about it in the world book and, and he said that he was afraid of clothes and he would pull on his clothes so to get him closer he was sitting in his underwear and he was, that, that's that was his thinking and uh he eventually came out, but uh, he went to Tim first, and then he saw me and he started pulling on Tim's arm like he was going to take him in the corn into the cornfield. But Tim was laughing and stuff like, "What are you doing, Mike? What are you doing?" And like, I walked up to him and that's when he stood up and gave me a hug. He like looked at me like he knew me and walked over and gave me a hug that almost like took all my air out of my lungs. And then so he came, it came out of the cornfield. Yeah, he was out of the cornfield by this time, and, and Tim had like tried pushing some things towards him like the toys and the ball he had hit that red ball that he was sitting on so hard that flew over in the trees and he popped it Tim thought that was really funny <laughs> and I, I, he backhanded it because like I'm sure he didn't understand why this thing's rolling towards him without, you know the physics of why they and just like hit it away from him like that but like then he started tugging on his tugging on his arm and it all happened pretty quick and then I mean as quick as he hugged me he heard something in the cornfield that made him leap 
and I'm like, look, we gotta like go tell somebody about this, all right? And like, he he, he grabbed his clothes and put them back on, and we um the babysitter had already made food, and I ate a little bit of it and Tim ate some, and he showed me the uh he showed me the the world book and the information that he could find. We didn't have the internet back then, obviously. We um left from there um because his parents weren't home. I would go tell my dad. It was Saturday. We're gonna go walk up there and tell him. We had to tell somebody about it. Um, Did the babysitter seem like alarmed by this troll? No, I think she was convinced it was an orangutan too. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you were after even when it hugged you. Yeah. yeah. Why would it? It Very looked light. a little strange, but like you know, I kept on asking him, you know, about it, and he said, you no. Know, as we walked back um, up to my or back up to my house. He was saying how friendly he was, and he had to be somebody's pet. I remember, you know, I was trying to figure out how he escaped, or you know, like there was a circus uh -huh. in town, and somebody lost it. You know, things ten-year-olds would talk about, and we couldn't figure it out. And um, we get halfway down there, and we could see the cornfield stalks moving, and Tim's like, "Oh, there he is!" And he like he actually popped up. Tim's waving at him, and Mike the Sasquatch is waving back and stuff. Uh, Oh, I forgot the I forgot the part where he actually did burp his name. He he was when I told you about it, he said I, I can he knows his name he can say his name he got him to say it, but it, it sounded more like a burp to me than anything else. But it did sound like Mike, and um, I think that he learned how to say that from that last encounter. Right. Um, did I skip that entirely? I think so. Yeah. So wh why was his name Mike? His name was Mike because of the, the past encounter in the August 77. This was September. This was a week later. I didn't finish the whole thing with with Mike. Oh, yeah, I did. But um, I figured that, that he, you know, later on that he had learned to say that because the searchers were out there. So oh, yelling, for, looking for the kid. Looking for the kid, Mike, and that's how they picked that word up. But, like, Tim was convinced that he had taught it how to right. you know, say that. Um, anyway, we get up to my house, um, and like, on our way up there, he's, he's an orangutan, Tim says he won't cross that fence, he won't cross that water, they hate water, he won't go across that creek. I'm like, okay, you know, he had me convinced it was an orangutan, I would have never been that brave to of what course. I did later. And I, when I hadn't told my dad... For the record, you were brave even if it was an orangutan. <laughs> Well, he, he had me convinced it was safe, too, that he, you know, for days that he had been real close and it's never, Done. he never showed any signs of aggression. And he never hurt the, the other boy, either, you know, he did the, you know, pretty much the same thing he took. Mike, they found him that day later um, without his clothes. Uh -huh. he, was, he wasn't hurt, he was traumatized, he got taken at night, but um, uh, we told my dad about it and he just, he laughed it off. And, and Tim went home, it was about dinner time. Um, I went in and ate dinner. Um, sometime after that, I got bored and I, I knew that Bionic Woman was coming on at the time and I didn't want to watch it, there was nothing else on TV. Right. And I wanted to go down and play in the barns. I had like a, all my toys down there on the second floor and a bunch of little buildings, like garages and stuff, all made, you know, whatnot. And um, they were a little bit concerned that there was an orangutan out there, and I told them that I would go lock all the doors on the second level. That an orangutan couldn't get up there. They, they don't climb or anything. Um, yeah, but the only the only it was an old milking barn that isn't there anymore. Um, because I told you it got hit by a tornado and tore the roof out, mm -hmm. and after that it just it you know rotted right away. Um, but the only way you could get to the second level probably where they. You know, for the milking barn, they just stored the hay up there for the cows to drop it down. And you had two ladders on the um, north and south end that, you know, you could climb up like that. And they had little things you could close after it and latch. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, all the other accesses on the outside were the, the hay doors that uh, ran casters that you could uh, lock with just a, a little latch thing like that. And I thought I was safe. I got up there. I wasn't even up there for more than a couple of minutes. And I thought my dad was coming in banging on the door one of those doors that um come up on the ladder mm -hmm. and i thought he for some reason just wanted to bang on it before he came up and all of a sudden it busts open you know and mike pops up i wasn't even scared i was like oh it's you <laughs> yeah, i'm serious i didn't he, he walks over and like plops in the the furthest part hay bell and at the time it was like almost all the way across the other side of the barn and he just sat there mm -hmm. And 
I was going like, oh, well, we'll see what this orangutan does, you know. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't go like right up to him. I sat in this this pile of hay, and um, each pile of hay had a rope that we us kids had put up there that had like um, loops on the bottom to where we could swing around really fast and then jump in the hay. And, and um, so those are, I don't know, about 25 feet apart from each other. And I sat in there, and I remember all the sounds that um, Tim said he made. So I, I was pretty good at making sounds. Mm -hmm. So I was doing cat sounds, and he started making the same sounds I did, but every time I would do it and then he would do it, he would make it way better and, like, add to it, like, all the noise a cat would make and hissing right. and, like, getting, mad, you know, mad cat sounds. And he made all those sounds. Did the same thing with a dog. I can do a baby cry. He did a baby cry, that, a human baby cry that was way better than mine. So we say monkey see, monkey do, but this was that, yeah. That, this he was, was monkey. Me up every, everything he did. And this was monkey see, monkey do much better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so like, he was sitting there the whole time, and his feet were like, you know, was, you know, I was looking at his feet, and they were wiggled around a lot. I didn't, I didn't know anything about primates or Sasquatch. I mean, I, even the word Sasquatch, all we knew was Bigfoot back then. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, and there was something on Six Million Dollar Man that was bionic and some no work of fiction. Had no idea there was anything like that. To me, it was some wild looking orangutan because he was, had the the reddish brown hair. Okay. But it was darker, way darker than you know, and more brown than orangutan. But it was still long on his arms and all that. It kind of resembled orangutan. So I I was brave enough to go up to it, and um, he gets up and walks up to me, and starts tugging on my shirt. So I remember what Tim said, so I took my shirt off to make him feel more comfortable on it. I wanted to play and chuck him out. I just, that's all I thought was in the right time. This guy said it was safe to be around. I'll play with him. And like, <laughs> I, I saw his feet. I took my shoes off next and I put my feet up on his feet. Just to like check him out. And he let me do that. Right. And I started pushing on his feet like you do when the kids do when you're pushing like that. And he yep. pushed me all the way backwards. So everything he did was like, you know, I didn't push that hard, he pushed way harder. But I didn't really figure out what he was doing until now, um, because you know, it totally changed the outlook of what what comes next. But um, I, I grabbed the rope since I ended up in the hay, I kind of rolled over backwards and he pushed me. And I broke close to that hay and I grabbed the rope and I thought I could, you know, there's no way an orangutan can do this. But I, I wasn't like that talented, but I put my foot in that rope and I got it going really good and I whipped it around that mm -hmm. that hay and like I, I jumped off and I rolled and I landed on my feet. And, he just looked at me and he grabs the rope <laughs> and he went upside down and he pulled himself up the rope and went upside down and grabbed the rafters with his feet. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, this older man can's going to kill himself, hang himself for something. And he like kind of look, he looked at what he was doing for like two or three seconds and I, I thought, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. And, but then he grabbed the rope and pulled it taut and pushed himself off with his feet and did like three times like that and landed exactly like I did and he just sat there. And it was like, oh wow, I thought that was so cool. I beat my chest. I want like, oh man. You know, see, I, I thought I made him mad by that. You know, like, uh -huh. you know, like that. Maybe that's that the middle my, finger. But he was just one up in me. One and when I did that, he beat his chest and his eyes turned red, and I could see those those teeth drop down when his jaw was fully open, and I knew it wasn't an orangutan. And he screamed at the same time. You know, his call and mm -hmm. like it was really loud. I was scared. I was turning around, going the other way, running as fast as I could to that door the, and trying to unlock it. I got to the door and the latch was closed and that was about as much as I am like trying to get it open and then I feel something grab my foot. I'm like, and he uh, started me pulling me towards him, trying to get away from the door. I kicked him in the face. I thought I was going to get eaten or killed or something at the time. I was uh, <laughs> screaming at the top of my lungs, help, and he jumped on top of me and held my arms down and got that close to my face and all I could hear was a lot of air coming towards my face and kind of like a hissing sound but I immediately calmed down and I couldn't move. I was aware of what was going on but I, I couldn't move, not that he was holding my arms down, I literally couldn't move. But I was, I was not panicking. Mm -hmm. And then I hear the door, which was real close to my head, the hay door banging and I thought my dad was finally there because I was calling for help. It was kind of help. Um, <laughs> it was his mom hearing it, us, you know, making all the noise and me screaming and him screaming. And probably what he was trying to do was quiet me down, but I thought he wanted to kill me or something. 
he didn't want his mom to hear him. Uh, but she ripped that door open to, you know, she didn't know what was going on. Maybe one of us was killing each other or something. Um, and she crawled right up into that second floor through that hay door and sat next to me for a second. And, and then as he still had me down, she, I've still got the scar that goes down here, just like, top from one swoop, just ripped like that and shredded him. Like, and all of a sudden she, she looked towards the door and I could see out there, there was another one out there and my dad was walking up on it, but it was behind the big hay barn and he couldn't see it yet. Mm -hmm. And they must have seen them from the house. The house was about an acre away from the barns. There was a little bit of a distance away from the barns. And he told me later that they didn't know what it was, but it, there was two bear-like hairy things on all fours running towards the back of the barn. And my dad grabbed his 16-gauge uh, his, uh, and went down there. And that's when it, the exact moment she saw him. I mean, the whole thing happened so fast. She was ready to jump out. As soon as she was ready to jump out, Mike grabbed my arm. He didn't have a good grip on it, but it was enough to pull me all the way out of that window, mm -hmm. that door, and fall seven feet down under it. Right in my back and knocked the air right out of me, and I screamed when I got up. And I'm <laughs> without trying to get up. My dad's helping me up, but he's not even looking at me. He's looking at them, and there's the, the well, it's probably the male with the, the mother she was dark black he would you know when i told you the color he was it was brown brownish red he was a much lighter color like a like a deer or a piece of cardboard probably what they call a blonde sasquatch and he was ahead of her and they were on their way out when i made that noise mike tried really hard to get away from his mom he was obviously too big for her to hold anyway he got away from her um and it started running on all fours back towards my father and I. And uh, the two adults were screaming, but they didn't make any towards advance for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, this all happened really fast, but Mike stood up, I don't know, maybe 10 feet away from us as he got up to uh, my dad and I kept on looking back and forth with my dad and me. and. He thought, and now I think he thought that my dad was hurting me, but I thought at the time um, that he wanted to, wanted to eat me or whatever and take me with him because he grabbed my arm and started pulling me to mm -hmm. take me with him. And I started screaming again, freaking out. And I told my dad to shoot him. My dad wouldn't do it. My dad shot into the air and it scared the mic away to about like 20 or 30 feet with the two adults got down off their hind legs, got on their all fours, and they were gone. They were down by the crib. Why don't you think your dad wanted to shoot it? Well, he told me later um, that he could tell it was a family, but he didn't think that 16 gauge would do any good. Right, so he just didn't want to, <laughs> yeah. he didn't want to make it, yeah. He thought the situation, he was a hunter, but like he, he got rid of all those guns a long time ago, and he just had that for house protection. He just hunts with, hung on with his bow until he can't hunt anymore, I mean. Don't shoot what you can't finish. Yeah. And um, he shot in there, that, and like I said, the, the two adults were gone. And Mike saw that the gun didn't do anything, he started coming back. And we freaked out, and my dad pulled me into the barn. And um, we went to the, the north, went to be the north um, room. I don't know why we didn't go in this other room that was completely closed off, but this north room had a window that faced east. Um, a loose board on the west side and of course we went to the, the south side door but like when we got in there he knew that this door these doors that faced the, the north were two big huge doors like for the the farmer to bring a tractor in there and work on um had a, when we moved in there a great big hole busted in it okay. why we went in that room it was beyond me and maybe he thought we could just fool this monkey and go straight out there into the house i don't know what his thinking was I didn't ask him that um but we got in there I, I had my back up against the door and he was checking to see if it was safe to go out through that hole and through the other areas when he came back he could see through this hole next to me it was only about like that big mm -hmm. probably big enough to get your hand through he could see an eyeball and before he could say anything about it I hand came through and Mike grabs me my arm and tries to pull me through that little hole 
My dad takes the butt of the gun and hit his arm and he screamed and it became quiet for a while and then my dad asked me why I was <laughs> and I told him they ripped my off. Um, and he pulls out of his pocket a bunch of, you know, um, shotgun shells that he had and he's going like, I don't know what to do, all I've got is bird shot and two slugs and he throws them on the ground and he starts putting them in with the gun again, some more, and he goes over to the, the um, we'll get the east side where this, this board would open and close like this where it had just one nail on the top and we used to like cut through there when we were playing hide and go seek in there and like he pushes that to peek through there uh -huh. and his gun's like sticking down here, he didn't stick the gun out but Mike grabbed that gun and he almost got it away from my dad and he shot while he had the he couldn't get the gun away from him. My dad had his leg up on the freaking right. side of the barn. He's trying to go like, oh, he's strong. He's going like that. And he finally shot, and that scared him away, and it got quiet again. And um, right then, he uh, we started hearing a siren coming from uh, down on 92nd Street, coming towards us. So how many minutes or hours is this after you fell out of the barn? Right. This has all happened like literally the whole encounter up 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 there. Probably five minutes was the whole encounter up there when I played with them, to just you know seconds to when I fell off there and we went in that room. Okay. Um, and we're in that room and like uh, um, we hear the siren coming towards us and it stops the fowls first. My mother was she must have told him to come down there and he still had his siren on. When he pulled in, he saw that Mike was going for that big hole in those two doors that you can see in my um, my art that I drew. Yep. And he cut Mike off as he was going to go into that. But Mike was going in there on all fours. And he comes to the cop, goes like, I cut that bear off. He comes in there, and, you know, he says, I cut that bear off before, you know, it got in here. Is that weird? You guys have a problem with? And why is he getting this? <laughs> was his next thing? And, you know, we told him, you know, it tore my clothes. And, the bear tore, tore your clothes off and my dad just shook his head, it's not a bear. And um, it wasn't very long after that, within seconds, that Mike made another appearance and they started shooting towards him this time. But he was um, he was somewhere on the outside trying to make his way in over by that loose board. Uh -huh. um, and then he ran away again, we thought. After a couple, a few seconds, I don't remember how long it was, maybe 30 seconds, a couple of minutes, it was quiet. And we heard the next set of sirens coming. Stopped at the house, there was the ambulance, and then it came down to there. And it stopped and shut its sirens off, and it was quiet, and the, and the cop decided it was time to go. And we went out, and I went out in between the cop and uh, my dad, and around the back of the cop car, and to the back of the, the ambulance, and the two attendants were out, just getting out of the, getting out of the there and they opened the back door to the ambulance. It was like a her style ambulance. It was an old Cadillac. And uh, out comes Mike. Um, it wasn't dark or nothing yet. It was getting dusk, but um, there's a little cooling barn in between the, the other, the, the, um, the milking barn and the hay barn that's still there. And he came around that and peeked around it. And like, they thought it was a bear too after they asked me why I was a kid. Um, <laughs> the ambulance attendants. Right. And uh, as they're putting me in the, you know, this is as they're putting me in the back of the ambulance and the other... Because you're bloody at this point, right? No, I didn't bleed it. Oh, just, okay. It just cut me open. Um, I don't know why I didn't bleed. It wasn't incredibly deep, but I did have to get stitched up. Um, maybe somebody can tell you why that doesn't bleed down there like that. I don't know. <laughs> I believe you. Um, let me see, where was I? Um, they saw what it was when he, when he came around the corner of that cooling barn and um, the grass was really long so they really couldn't see when he was on all fours until he got closer and he stood up probably about like 20 feet away from the end of that the ambulance he stood up on on his hind legs and they knew something was really unusual then and uh they shot in the air again to scare him off and it wasn't working he wouldn't go past that cooling barn he would just turn around and just like peek around that thing even mm -hmm. or shoot him okay in the air like he knew that it was just noise. Right. Well, he noticed that the cop seemed to notice that, that he didn't like those sirens and the cop went right after that and turned the sirens back on in the ambulance and this cop car and that drove him off. And it got quiet, we went up to the house. Um, 
I think I, I think it was a like a DNR or um, something that showed up at my house um, right after we got inside, and, and the cop and the DNR guy um, were just inside the porch of the mud room watching the barn, watching out with their guns, and they uh, hear gunshots come from a neighbor's house in that direction, and they get a call on the radio that my neighbors are shooting at something, and they said they had to take off. That you know, that's where they're going, and. So now that the cops and are just on their way to your neighbor's house because they're shooting at something. Yep. Okay. And we can hear the gunshots from the kitchen, my hallway from you know, you know, almost a mile away, and there were several gunshots. Um, um, the paramedics did uh, whatever they were doing. I don't know if they did. You know, they, they, they patched me up, told me I had to go to the hospital to get more stitches. Um, before we made out of the out of the um, uh, my driveway. Uh, the cops rode back up the state police cop car. And that's when I noticed it was a Pontiac because that was the only car I knew that symbol. Mm -hmm. And I was going like, look at it, it's a Pontiac. And like the cop told me that this cop car was like his his chief's cop car. That it was a special order Pontiac that he worked at GM for all these years and his family did. That's how I knew about kind of, what kind of cop car that was. But um, he said that the locals were down there and that I could go down there and he's going home. That was the end of his shift. And we wanted to find out what happened, and he told us a little bit about, you know, that the Sasquatches went down there and tried to break into the house and got into the house, and they were shooting at him. That's all he told us. So we went down there, you know, concerned about our neighbors and our, my friends, and, and when we got down there, <clears throat> the wife and the kids were packing the car up, but Tim was gone. All the other kids were packing clothes in the car. Um, the father was in the house. Um, talking with the local police. Um, the house was ransacked and we didn't know exa exactly what happened yet. And my dad went in to uh, talk to um, Tim's father and I went to go find Tim. He was in the cornfield crying and bawling. Really mad at his dad for shooting his friend. But I... Do um, you know if Tim was still thinking it's an orangutan? Well, yeah, he was at the time. Okay. Yeah. I think it was his... Friend orangutan? <laughs> Right, his friend orangutan, and um, I went back in the house to hear the, uh, what happened from his father. Tim wouldn't come in the house, he was too mad. Um, he was going to leave with his mother, with his uh, other brother and sisters when they were ready to go. But I wanted to find out what happened, and his father told me that as soon as they got home, and the sort of went, that, um, went home, that, um, they, you know, they turned on the TV, and started watching TV and there was all sorts of racket outside. And it got to be banging on the houses and then it got to be really loud banging and screams and you know, all sorts of Sasquatch noises, but you know, described differently back then because nobody knew these things existed at all. Um, it, it must have got so bad to where they, the, the family was in the middle of the, and this is what he told us, and the family huddled up in the middle of the, away from the windows and everything in the middle of the living room and had their, their rifle with them. And uh, eventually, Mike, the Sasquatch, broke in through the, the bathroom window and came in and I don't know exactly how he greeted himself, but he went for Tim and grabbed Tim by the arm and tried to drag him out of the house. And um, Through the window it came in. Yeah, he, it, there, was a, there was a pump house at the time and they were putting the addition in the back and the small bathroom window had a pump house that he could step on to get up to the window. Mm -hmm. And he busted through that and came through the, the bathroom. The bathroom emptied out in the hallway that opened up into, you know, the living room right there. And he just, in turn, was there watching TV. So he only took a few steps. There, there's another note there that they had, they had a, an anti cam that picked this up too, but that's government's property now. Mike came in and grabbed him and um, uh, his father took the shot. And it, it um, he said it slammed up against the wall and somehow he made it back out that bathroom window and there was a trail of blood going out through there and broken glass and and fo footprints and that's what he told us back then. That's how, that's the only relay of you know the way I heard the story because um, you know, I never talked to any of them again after that right. because uh, the circumstances what happened except for his dad. Um, I went to the hospital and got stitched up and. Um, the following day I got a call early in the morning 
So it was on hold. By the way, they, they looked for the body. They couldn't find it that night. It got, by the time they got done with all the reports and when, you know, the government showed up, they, it was dark and they couldn't find anything. And there was a quick trick, like I said, running through their property to the back of their house. And um, Tim's father calls me in the morning and says, I found your friend. You want to see him before, you know, they get here and I give him to him. And I said, sure. And I walked down there. I got down to their house. And uh, the neighbor boy was uh, um, a year older than me, was at the house, the other Tim's house, and said that Tim's father was over at their house in the back with the body. I went over there and only the neighbor, that neighbor boy and his father were there. The rest of his family were gone. Um, and they had Mike's body on a picnic table back behind their house by a pole barn where they had horses and two of the horses had died of that PPD poisoning and I told you that was mm -hmm. going around back then. And he had already um, dug a shallow grave and it was typical back then and the state would come pick these poisoned horses and cows up and put them in a mass grave. Which is another reason why I think the Sasquatches were close to my barn was a dumping site from the farm next door that right. you know, were putting their, their cows next to our property where that creek ran behind their house. That's what they told them to do because that little swamp there, they said would clean their blood and like all the poisons that were in it before it hit right. the creek. Well, I went down there sometimes and that creek was red with blood where they, where they piled those, piles up, those cows up until they took them. But, um, excuse me a minute. Where was I? Um, can I take a break here a second? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to break in super dry throat. Is that still on? Yeah, you Yeah, we're going to take cigarette breaks if you want. Yeah, let's go take a cigarette. Yeah, because what I do off, uh, I'll remember that now. Like, I got over there. Like, I've had to, like, like I said, the memories didn't, like, all come piling back. It was bits and pieces and big chunks. Right. With pieces missing in between. Well, the government was already alerted to these Sasquatches, you know, like I told you, yeah, I was you're going to get to that at the end when they started talking about it, that, you know, they were a problem. Well, I mean, when you people freak out when they, I mean, think about what that kid had to go through. I mean, getting... Well, you went through it, too. Day, but you weren't taken. I could, even then, I could have handled it. They didn't have to hypnotize me. I didn't have to. I wouldn't have been traumatic. I knew it was a an animal and you know and that's you know they do animal things they don't do human things right they don't live by our set of rules um i knew that back then you know i could have i could live with that i wouldn't have been traumatized uh -huh. um but getting taken at night that would be way different not knowing what the hell i saw what it was i could see it was a primate i'm gonna be totally honest if that happened to me last night if our the car broke down and that happened to me last night i would not recover from it really no i don't think i would recover from that i think it would be hard I, not now. I mean, dude, I could talk about it. But I can, like, if we had a problem with Sasquatch, I could talk our way out of it. You know, freak out. They're, you could they, talk they your way out go, of it. They don't go to freak out mode right away. You They're, could talk your way out of it with it. Yeah. I, if you don't freak out and start screaming, because they just, they don't, they don't go to panic mode right away. They're, if they're around you, they're checking you out because they're curious or you happen to cross their path. Yeah. And if they, and it's their home they're not going to immediately attack you. They're going to give you one the, the the bluff charge, or they're going to throw something at you, or they're going to just make noise and make you go away. Then the, the last thing they want to do, because they're aware of their own mortality, is get hurt again to a confrontation with a human. They know that might not end well. Have a gun, or you know. Right. All right. Let's take that break. They're smart enough to figure that out. Of course, the juveniles don't know that. That's why the, the Michigan Dogman thing is so heard about because you know they're juveniles and. And people see the way they run, you see the way I drew them and the way they move, they look like a werewolf or a dog-like thing because they're, the way their feet bend like this, like this, in the back it kind of looks like a dog leg, you know, and they're on their, on their toes like that, and then their foot goes like that. You know what I mean? I drew pictures of it like that up there, but... Part two of the interview is on Patreon. There's just no way YouTube would consider it permissible. I can deal with restrictions, but I can't risk strikes, which the rest of this interview would certainly earn me. I'll also be putting more commentary up on Patreon sooner than later. Also, on Patreon you can find Randy and my walk down his hall of drawn memories. Okay, 
so I made a decision not to dig too much deeper into this, publicly at least, because I don't want to affect anyone's life who was involved with this story. So if you want specifics and details, like last names and locations, you won't find them here. Randy, however, is pretty open in that regard, and I can tell you he's very approachable and very kind. That being said, I'd be happy to dig a little deeper into the details of Randy's descriptions. First, the four-legged thing really threw me for a loop a bit. I wasn't expecting it. It wasn't my view of Sasquatch. I'm inclined to think that anything this proficient as a biped wouldn't be too adept on all fours. Like how bears are quadrupeds, and obviously are quite ill-equipped to get around on two legs, even though technically they're capable of it, and even in extreme circumstances are reliant on it. Anyway, I said something to Randy about this. And see, this is a good example of why I think Randy has a lot of wisdom about this matter. He said something like, You're looking at it wrong. It's not about what's comfortable, it's just that they do what they have to do. Like how soldiers crawl around when they need cover. So Randy thinks they are not necessarily built for four-legged motion. Simply that they're adaptable and good at it. And Randy notes that a shockingly small amount of their body makes contact with the ground when they crawl which very well may account for a lack of tracks. I asked Randy if they use their knuckles when they're on all fours, and he said yes, because it works for them. So it's not like biologically speaking, yada yada. It's like they have to do it to stay low, so they do it. Although from Randy's description, they do seem to be on some level built for it, so to speak. The second feature I'd like to discuss are these hind tusks that he described. I'm not aware of any mammal that has this characteristic, nor do I know what function they perform, or what service they would offer. The only real commentary I can give is that they don't have protruding canines, according to Randy. I would imagine that they at least have relatively small canines, like chimps, or at the very least like ours. Though according to Randy's illustrations, they are not elongated enough to stand out or to be notably different from the rest. And I find it rather compelling that Randy's drawings are all consistent in this regard. And he said he didn't remember any elongated canines though he did mention that their teeth are rarely visible because of their flexible lips, which of course is a quintessential and well-known primate feature. And it's not only for eating, but also for communication and non-verbal cues, but perhaps most importantly, for emoting, which is absolutely essential for any cooperative effort. So my only guess would be that for some reason, these tusks, or extended molars, replaced the function of canine teeth because the canines were inefficient in some way, but I don't know. I don't know what to make of this little bigfoot dumb non sequitur. Number three. Two hearts. Or as Randy called it, a detached chamber. I believe this is in the second part of the interview, although I cover it in the full version of this narrative that I have on my channel. But two men performed an autopsy on Mike, and they described sort of another smaller heart, or an organ beside the heart, that obviously had something to do with pumping blood. At first, I thought this was indeed another anatomical feature that does not have precedence in the natural world, or at least, not in the mammalian world, but I was a little surprised to learn the contrary. According to a 1985 article in the National Library of Medicine, the manatee has a bulbous ascending aorta. The speculation, which hasn't changed since 85, is that this morphological feature trends toward, quote, specialization for a more energetic aquatic lifestyle. According to the article, this interventricle cleft with a conical left ventricle has, quote, astonished scientists since the 18th century. The article also states that this morphological anomaly's presence in the manatee, but not the similar dugong, quote, is a mystery. Randy heard the two hunters call it two hearts, but perhaps if the Michigan hunters were familiar with the cardiovascular apparatus of the manatee, Maybe they would have settled on an interventricular cleft with a conical left ventricle beside a bulbous ascending aorta. I wonder if Randy knew all about this when he made this story up. Manatees perform similarly in intelligence tests as dolphins. The key difference, of course, is that manatees tend to be less eager to perform as dolphins, but manatees are actually ranked among the most intelligent creatures on Earth. And they're large, and they have a feature that is unprecedented in the mammalian world a feature that is not found in their closest of kin, which is curious. Number four, infrasound. I have a full video on infrasound, so I won't get too much into the mechanics of it all, mostly because I don't really understand it, or at least not well enough to explain it with any confidence. But according to the National Toxicology Program, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Infrasound, a 2001 article, tigers, hippos, elephants, whales, octopus, pigeons, squid, 
cuttlefish, cod, guinea fowl, guinea pigs, and rhinos have all been documented using it. Humans do too, though we can't produce it ourselves, that we know of. Actually, and I just looked this up, a singer named Tim Storms can hit notes on the infrasonic level. He told CNN that he can't hear the notes, but quote, I can feel them though. It's something more or less that I feel. So that's kind of an interesting development. Infrasound is known to have a wide array of effects on people. These are the ones we can prove. Inner ear vertigo, imbalance, intolerable sensations, incapacitation, disorientation, nausea, vomiting, resonances in inner organs, including the heart, and bowel spasm. According to the relatively current literature, hallucinations are not an effect. However, if an animal is as smart as Randy's story indicates, and said being could indeed produce the required frequencies, then wouldn't it play with it? Why wouldn't it? I would. Wouldn't you? Randy literally said he sat there and played a mimicking game with the darn thing. Clearly it had an interest in sounds and playing, so why not? And just like the heart, and perhaps even the tusks, if this creature diverged from primates, say in North America, and went through time, congruent with, but separate from, the great apes in the old world, perhaps it would indeed have alien features and attributes that would almost come off as superhuman. I suppose it would have needed to, to remain undetected. Which indeed seems to be the case. The folks who lived here for 10,000 years and more seem to think so. But we know everything now, right? I feel bad for Randy, because he tried to make the rounds with all the usual folks, and it seems like no one wanted to touch his story with a ten Bigfoot pole. And at this point, he probably thinks I'm one of them, seeing as I've sat on this story for years. But you know what? The more I look into this, the more real it becomes, not less. Do you think a creature of this description, lonely and bored with watching, may be tempted to interact with those which he deemed friendly? And how do you think that would go for him? I don't know. What I do know is that sometimes restraint on the high strangeness is not how you get to the truth. And that brings me to the thing that I find perhaps the most intriguing about this entire saga. When you think about it, in context with the creature in question, Randy's story is probable. It's likely. If these creatures are intelligent and social, then this is a very plausible event to happen. And yet, this is the type of encounter that is the least likely to ever get covered because it's complicated, much like life. Anyway, I have a lot more thoughts on my time with Randy, and I really do hope to meet with him once more in the near future. Parts two and three of this interview are on Patreon, and I really am sorry about that, but I can't risk my channel, and it seems like a good way to thank the people who have supported me throughout these trying times, and I'll probably upload there sporadically on this topic. So feel free to head over there to check out more of this incredible and unbelievable chapter of Bigfoot. Anyway, make sure to like and subscribe to see more content. And until we meet again, and as always, thanks an awful lot for listening. Even though you didn't know what it was? Yeah, even though I didn't have any idea of what it was. Right. And, you know, a week later it was Tim playing with an orangutan. We all thought he was crazy until we started, until I saw it in the cornfield, you know. Uh -huh. Even then the babysitter saw it before I even went out there and she called it a troll. Like a troll. <laughs> he did look like a troll. <laughs> so then, 